Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. We just finished our midterm exam. Uh, I put a little poll out there in the Twitch chat and uh, asked if it was easy or fair or hard, and everyone was saying it was fair. So that's all you can really ask for as a, a professor, I guess, is that um, nobody thought it was too easy and nobody thought it was too hard. Um, don't take my word on it yet. I'm about halfway through uh, correcting the exams, but it's not looking good for the play crew. Looks like the Nopers might have, uh, might have taken it again this year, but, uh, I'll discuss that <laughs> at a later time, because that always causes a lot of controversy. But today, um, we are talking about evolutionary computation and evolutionary algorithms. I see a lot of, uh, reaction out there in the chat already, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in, um, in another <laughs> lecture. All right, so let's get down to today's lecture. Lecture number 11, um, introduction to evolutionary computation and evolutionary algorithms, as it is essentially known. So what is evolutionary computation? Well, you hear evolution, you might think of biology. Uh, you'd be right, but evolutionary computing is a part of computer science. It's not a part of the life sciences and biology. So they don't teach evolutionary computing in biology. Or maybe they would, maybe as like an elective at a higher thing, but it's, it's really a computer science and algorithms type of course. However, EC derives all of its inspiration and terminology from biology. Okay, so essentially what happened was that in the pursuit of new algorithms, some very smart people looked toward nature and said, nature is pretty smart. It produces some really cool stuff. How does nature do things? Oh, evolution. Evolution's pretty cool. Let's try and simulate evolution in an algorithm. And that's what evolutionary computation is. And EC can be applied in biological research. It certainly can, but it has many, many possible applications. And so, you do not have to have any sort of application related to biology whatsoever to apply evolutionary computing. And you'll see, like, you can do a Sudoku solver with a genetic algorithm, right? It has nothing to do with, with biology. So the main metaphor, if you will, of evolutionary computation is we're going to relate problem-solving ideas to ideas in nature and natural evolution. So the problem in our problem solving domain, that's going to be the environment in the evolutionary domain. A candidate solution to the problem in the problem solving domain is going to be an individual in the evolution domain. And the quality of the solution that we found, or the, the quality of a candidate solution that we found in our problem solving domain is going to be the fitness in in evolutionary terms. So quality is the chance for, for moving on and creating a new solution, whereas fitness would be the chance of survival and reproduction, okay? So we draw these analogies between problem-solving mathematical algorithmic things and evolutionary things. Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to this and we'll talk about what each of these means, but a brief history of evolutionary computation it's not exactly a new thing. So in ninth, back in the 40s, Alan Turing, absolute genius, was talking about genetical or evolutionary search. So like before there were computers, <laughs> he was talking about this. Excuse me, I have something. I had like a small cat here in my mouth, apologies. Someone out there says this looks like a lot like uh, Comp 3201. It is. So if you did evolutionary algorithms before, this is the same thing. It's just like, I wanted to include a couple of lectures on evolutionary computation in this course because it's sort of an introduction to AI as a whole. So we're just gonna spend two lectures on this. It's not like the whole course is about um, nature-inspired computing. We have a whole course to, devoted to that. In 1962, Bremerman talked about optimization through evolution. In 64, uh, Reckenberg talked about evolutionary strategies. 1965, uh, Fogel talked about evolutionary programming. In 75, Holland genetic algorithms were created. Uh, Coza in 92, genetic programming. 
And in 2021, 3200 assignment four, right? This is the pinnacle of achievement in evolutionary computing is, is this year's assignment four. So just realize that without going into too much of the, of the history, it's been around a while. It's, it's a very well-developed uh, field and evolutionary computation and genetic algorithms and all that was sort of, you know how neural networks are like the, the current big thing in AI? Um, evolutionary computing was like the neural networks of 15 years ago. Okay, so like 15 years ago, evolutionary algorithms were super hot. They could do anything. Slowly more like Monte Carlo tree search came in and replaced a bit of EC and then neural networks replaced a bit of Monte Carlo tree search. And so there's, you know, there's always a, a current trend in AI. And trust me when I say that evolutionary computing had its heyday and is actually making a comeback now, which is, which is really cool. All right. So Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest. I want to make a note a caveat here that probably every single one of you in the chat, every single one of you watching this video right now has done more biology courses than I have because I have done zero biology courses at any level of my schooling. I managed to do like in junior high and high school, I did like the extra physics course or the extra math course instead of biology, right? I, <laughs> I was never really interested in biology. Not to say I know nothing about it, but just that I have done no courses where my knowledge has been tested. So I know that this is true, this, the stuff that I'm about to tell you about biology, because I've had several legit biologists actually look at it and tell me that it's true. However, I'm not an expert in it. Okay, so if you're like, but what about the genome? I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just including some, this is sort of the inspiration for the algorithm, which I am the expert on, right? So take this with a grain of salt. And if you're watching this and you're worried about an exam, none of the biology stuff will be on any exam ever. I will not do that to you. This is a computer science course. However, it's part of the story that is artificial intelligence. So we should tell it. All right. So Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest, that says fittest there. Um, okay, so what is it? You've probably heard of evolution. Maybe you haven't been taught it. I don't know, but here's a little like Cole's Notes version of Darwinian evolution. It all starts with the fact that environments have finite resources, okay? Meaning there's only so much food. There's only so much water. There's only so much land. There's some resource that you need for survival. And there are other things that also need that for survival, right? So life forms have some sort of basic instinct and life cycles are geared toward reproduction. So without getting too philosophical with you, um, people often get bogged down in like, what is the meaning of life? Right. So people will ask, what is the point of it all? Like, why are we here? What's the grand scheme? And it may be a little depressing for you to hear this, but the reason we're alive is because two people had sex. That's it. There's nothing else. Right. The things that exist were better at reproducing than the things that don't exist. That, that is the meaning of life. That's why you're here. Whether or not that was like some grand plan of your parents or some night at the breezeway gone too far, like that's, that's why you exist is because you were born. And so the unfortunate, I guess, if you, if you look at it either fortunately or unfortunately, the people who are around and the, the, the organisms that multiply like COVID or mosquitoes that transmit malaria, whatever. The reason they exist is because they're the best at existing and the best at reproducing. And that's it. They're just better suited to live in that environment. And, and that's the way she goes. <laughs> so that's Darwin, right? So since we're geared toward reproduction and in order to, to survive, we need to reproduce, and in order to reproduce, we need resources. Some sort of selection is inevitable, 
right? If I happen to get to that deer carcass before you as a hyena, I'm going to eat it and you're not. And that's just the way it goes. So if you happen to, you know, if you're in the gym and you're faster than me and you get to the food, that's it, that you get it. If you're a hawk with better eyesight than another hawk and you can see the mouse, you get it. And the other person doesn't. That's Darwin, right? Get good. So individuals that compete for resources most effectively have increased chance of reproduction. So what this means is if you are better at getting the resources, then you, you, you reproduce better. Now, it's not always that getting the resources is the thing, right? Some, some animals are a little bit sneaky when it comes to reproduction and sort of lie, cheat, and steal their way into it. But for the most part, if you have gotten resources that someone else hasn't, you're, you're statistically more likely to reproduce than someone that hasn't, right? So this is an important fact, and it's not that obvious. When we talk about fitness in nature, fitness is a derived secondary measure. What do I mean by that? We assign a high fitness to individuals with many offspring, right? So we don't, we can't measure fitness directly. You can't look at a great ape or a lizard or a snake and say that thing is more fit. You just can't do it because fitness is in relation to an environment, right? A huge, big, strong gorilla is really fit for the jungle, but not for the Arctic, right? So you can't just assign a fitness. What you have to do is let nature play out, and then you have a higher fitness if you had more offspring. Because here, fitness literally just means your ability to reproduce. Because in the end, that's literally all that matters. Because the things that are alive are the things that reproduced. There you go. So, Darwinian evolution. Now we're going to get into a little bit of terminology, a little bit of bio <laughs> biology terminology, which is going to lead into like our variable names and stuff when we get into evolutionary computing. So, phenotypic traits. We have these phenotypes. The phenotypic traits are behaviors or physical differences that affect individual responses to the environment. They are partly determined by inheritance, so your genes, and partly by factors during development, such as, you know, you have this nature versus nurture. They are unique to each individual, partly as a result of random change. So essentially what this is saying is that each individual is going to have some traits that are specific to it. Some of those traits are going to be, well, traits in general are somewhat derived from your genetics or inheritance because, you know, we're going to combine genes from your, from your parents and partly due to factors during development. Okay. Like if you were, you know, around Chernobyl or something like that, you're going to have different traits than, than someone else. Uh, so, Trait inheritance. If phenotypic traits lead to higher chances of reproduction, then these traits are passed on to their offspring or inherited. And along with random mutations, this leads to new combinations of traits that lead to more fit individuals. So essentially what's happening is that if certain individuals happen to be well suited to survive in an environment, then statistically speaking, they are more likely to reproduce. And so the traits that they had are going to be genetically passed off into offspring. And since you're taking like one fit individual and another fit individual and combining genes, right? Then over time, what happens or what seems to happen is that you get more fit individuals over time. And the less fit individuals don't get to reproduce. And so their genes are not passed on. And so this is one of the people who don't... Here, here's a little bit of information for you. Here, here's a little uh, a catchphrase, if you will, that I like to 
to say when it comes to people who do not believe in evolution. People who don't believe in evolution don't understand evolution, right? They've been, they've been biased toward not believing in it by some other thing. And, and one of the main arguments is that, like, how did the, the frog learn how to jump far? How did the tiger learn how to run fast? Right? Like, that couldn't have come out of just evolution. There's no learning. The organism does not decide what it is. It's just through random mutations and combinations and natural selection of the people who have reproduced, those traits appeared and they stuck around if they were beneficial. Okay? So the tiger is a tiger because whatever became a tiger, that thing is really well suited to kill things and eat. Right? Nothing learned to be a tiger. So it's... I don't want to say randomness. Random mutation does have a part to play in it. But the selection of fit individuals combined with them recombining and random mutations produced something. And if that something was good, it stuck around. If that something wasn't good, it didn't stick around. And so there's this huge selection bias when you go to observe evolution. Because all you see are the good things that are still around. So people say, oh, evolution couldn't have produced all this good stuff when they don't see the trillions and trillions of organisms that failed because they were not fit enough to reproduce. Okay, so evolution doesn't just produce fit individuals. However, the overall trend as time goes on is that more and more fit individuals are produced. But there's still random mutations and, and combinations that produce unfit individuals as well. They just happen to reproduce less. Okay, so here's some terminology. A population consists of many possibly diverse individuals. Combinations of traits that are better suited for a given environment lead to a higher chance of reproductions. So individuals are sort of the unit of selection, right? They are the things that are selected to, to, re to reproduce. And note here that this is very, very important. A higher chance of reproduction. You are not guaranteed to reproduce, okay? No matter what happens. You can be hit by a bus. Variations occurring through random changes yield constant sources of diversity. And when coupled with selection, it means that the population is the unit of evolution. So individuals do not evolve. Okay? People often use the term like I've evolved whatever. But when it comes to natural evolution... Individuals do not evolve during their lifetime. I can learn stuff. I wasn't born being able to teach this course. I wasn't born even being able to stand. I learned how to do those things. But the population surrounding me and that produced me and that will come after me does evolve, right? Only through life and death and selection and reproduction does evolution happen. So it does not happen within an individual. It happens with the population over time. All right. Once again, I'm not a biologist. I have included these slides for people who are interested in it and also to tell part of the story. So I am going to sort of zoom through a few slides here <laughs> because I want to have the information there for you, but I'm not going to focus on it and it's not going to be in our assignment or on our exams. I just want to, you know, complete that story. All right. The information, I, I just, just as a quick note, I see uh, a few messages uh, in the chat, some nice things being said and some questions. I, I can't get to them right now, but I'll come back to them um, once I'm finished the lecture. So it's hard to, hard to respond to everything while you're teaching. So the information required to build a living organism is coded in the organism's DNA. So the DNA is like your source code, essentially. The genotype inside your DNA Okay, so the, ge the genotype is the DNA. Your DNA forms a genotype. That determines the phenotype. 
Genotype to phenotypic traits is a complex mapping. What that means is just like source code, right? So if I take some source code over here and I have some other source code over here, if I change like three lines out of 100,000, it could produce something wildly different, right? So if you think about it, the machine that is the universe, that is running the code that is your DNA, we don't know the machine, but we do know that this DNA is essentially your source code, right? So one little bit, one gene out of your whole, out of all your DNA may affect many traits. That's called pleiotropy. Or many genes may affect one trait polygyny. And all that means is like, you know, you may have a bunch of random parts of your code that produce one thing. Like maybe you have a bunch of stuff related to the front end, or maybe one line of code is going to affect a bunch of different things in your system, right? Maybe your logger or something like that. So I know I'm trying to like, you know, I'm, I'm patronizing everybody by giving source code analogies for this, but that's, that's what it is, right? And so changes in the genotype may lead to changes in the organism, meaning that changes in your source code might lead to changes in the output of your program. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. A lot of times when it comes to source code, it will, right? Because computers are quite exact. So genes and the genome. DNA and the nitrogenous bases. So you've got adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. That's the A, T, C, and G that make up your DNA. Genes are functional units of stretches of DNA on chromosomes, okay? So genes are not the whole DNA. Your DNA is made up of a bunch of different genes. And they're functional stretches of this. So scientists over time have looked at the genome and they have found Oh, sorry. So the complete genetic material in an individual's genotype is called the genome. So everything together is called the genome. Scientists have found that certain parts of the genome map to certain things, or they've observed that when this changes, this thing changes. And so those are genes. Example, Homo sapiens, that's us. Um, human DNA is organized into chromosomes. Human body cells contain 23 pairs of chromosomes which together define the physical attributes of the individual. Now, that's for the most part, right? Some humans, um, when they're born, they have fewer or more chromosomes, but it's quite rare. So this is, this is sort of the human typical setup. Uh, this is what they look like. I don't know what that means. All right. It's like, you know, you like to have <laughs> diagrams when you can, right? Okay. Reproductive cells. Gametes, sperm and egg cells, contain 23 individual chromosomes rather than 23 pairs. So you've got the human body containing 23 pairs of chromosomes, but the gametes contain 23 individuals rather than 23 pairs. Cells with only one copy of each chromosome are called haploid. Gametes are formed by a special form of cell splitting called meiosis. I've heard of meiosis before. I don't know what it is. During meiosis, meiosis, however, the pairs of chromosomes undergo an operation called crossover. This is the important part because this is the thing you have to do for your assignment. What is crossover? Chromosome pairs align and duplicate. So sister chromatids attach at a centromere and homogeneous... <laughs> homologous chromosome pairs swap genetic material. This is chromosomal crossover. And we'll, we'll see what the algorithmic equivalent of that is soon enough. So these chromosomes are pulled apart to form the two new daughter cells. And then those two cells will divide again. And the outcome is four new haploid gamete cells. So here's the fertilization process. You've got the sperm cell from the father You've got the egg cell from the mother, and you combine these. Um, you see here, these are single, these are single, you combine them, and now you have a new person with all the pairs, okay? But essentially, these, um, these from the father and these from the mother are going to combine in a process called crossover. After fertilization, the zygote rapidly divides, creating many cells with the same genetic contents. Although all cells contain the same genes, depending on 
For example, where they are in the organism, they'll behave differently. This process of differential behavior during development is called ontogenesis, and it will have an analogy to our algorithm. And all of this uses and is controlled by the same mechanism for decoding the genes in DNA. So when it comes to the genetic code, all proteins in life on Earth are composed of sequences built from 20 different amino acids, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. And DNA is built from four nucleotides in a double helix spiral. So purines A and G and pyrimidines T and C. Triplets of those form codons, each of which codes for a specific amino acid. And the genetic code is essentially the mapping from codons to amino acids. This, I, I don't know. I just I just included that. I'm sorry. I'm a bad teacher. All right. So mutation. This isn't this is back to being important. Occasionally, some of the genetic material changes very slightly during that process. So for example, you've got things replicating. Any machine is going to have some sort of error, right? If you do something 100 million times, one or two of them are going to be wrong. So caused by replication error could also be caused by environment, right? So for example, radiation can cause genes to mutate. It can cause DNA to mutate. It can cause errors in replication. This means that the child might have genetic material that is not inherited from either parent. When this happens, one of three things can happen. It can either be catastrophic, meaning that the offspring is just not viable. And in a lot of cases of mutation, what you get is a gene has mutated, which essentially causes the DNA equivalent of a segmentation fault, right? You produce something that is not a viable candidate for living in an environment. Unfortunately, it does happen. That mutation could also be completely neutral. Maybe one of the pieces of code that got changed in your source code was a comment, right? So it didn't really matter that much. Maybe the, you know, the DNA comments got changed. Uh, however, something we are looking for is advantageous things, right? So maybe you got the, the one line of code that like really speeds things up. Now you're faster or stronger or you're a different color, which matches your environment. So now you're camouflaged, right? So advantageous, that's great. We're looking for advantageous things. Okay. So those are all the building blocks. Important notes. Individuals do not intentionally change themselves to suit an environment. There is no learning involved in this process. Now, as humans, we would say, bullshit, we change all the time. Yes, but that doesn't have to do with our DNA, at least not yet. Science is getting there, though. It's kind of crazy. We're not talking about someone learning that hiding in a cave was a good strategy or building a house was a good strategy. We're talking about the DNA that physically makes them. You cannot change your own DNA to say, I want to be stronger, right? At least not yet. Fit, repro fit individuals reproduce and unfit ones don't. So good traits of parents that reproduce are passed on to the offspring. Sometimes producing individuals that are fitter than each parent. Random mutations can introduce new traits, and sometimes those new traits can be even better than what they were before, and this process produces more and more fit individuals. Here's an example of evolution that was seen in our lifetime. Not my lifetime, but in human beings' lifetime. The peppered moth. So... This moth, I'm going to be paraphrasing this story, but it's the overall message is true. The peppered moth was this light colored moth down here. Okay, so you can see this is the original peppered moth. Boom. It lived on trees that looked like this. They were this lightish brown color. Let's, let's, you know, they're not exactly like birch trees, but let's say they were on birch trees, for example. They lived quite happily, you know, these moths flying around, eating, reproducing, drinking, having a good time. 
And then humans came along and messed everything up. So humans had this thing called the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution produced a ton of pollution. And what happened was, over the course of a couple of decades, the trees in the area became blackened by this pollution. Okay? So the tree's DNA wasn't changed. They just changed color because there's all this pollution in the air. So it's like sucking it in and the, the trees changed color. So what happened was these generations of moths, every few generations, maybe every few thousand individuals, the moths had a genetic mutation, which would make it so that one of the moths was born darker. Right? Just a little genetic mutation that changes the color of the wings. Before, when a moth was born with a darker color, it would really stand out against the lighter trees. And so that genetic trait did not suit that environment. So a bird would just see it, come down, swoop down, eat it. Right? So that moth did not have a chance to reproduce because it was not fit to, to, to produce in that environment, right? It was unfit for that environment because it wasn't camouflaged in the same way. However, as the trees got darker, that genetic mutation that happened every so often became more advantageous. So essentially what happened, because now the lighter colored moths are easy to spot and the birds are coming down and they're eating those, and they're not able to see the darker colored moths as well anymore. The darker colored moths are now more fit for the environment. So the environment changed and the same moth that wasn't fit before is now super fit for this new environment. And so because more and more of the white ones are dying off and more and more of the dark ones are surviving to reproduce, their genes that made them dark are being passed on to their offspring and slowly over time the color of the peppered moth flipped it flipped from light to dark and so that's it's just like it's that actually happened the moths did not choose to camouflage themselves they didn't sit around thinking okay you go like make make some paint and we'll paint our wings so that we'll be better no like obviously that didn't happen right it was just Random mutations produced moths with different colors. And then those moths didn't die as often anymore. They weren't eaten. They got a chance to reproduce. And their genetic code that made them dark was passed to their offspring. That is evolution. Nobody decided anything. It's just the thing that made them good for the environment changed over time. And evolution reflected that. All right. So that's like, it's a cool study that actually happened that scientists could observe in their lifetime. Typically, this isn't the case, right? Typically, evolution takes thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. But this one occurred in just a few decades. I think it was a few decades. It was, scientists saw it happen anyway. So some of the motivations for evolutionary computation. So nature has always served as an inspiration for engineers and scientists, right? Whenever you go to create something new, you look at what's been done before. You, why would you reinvent the wheel all the time? Look to nature, see what nature has done. Developing new problem solving methods, so algorithms, is a central theme in math and computer science. Basically my job all the university cares about. The university doesn't care about my teaching. Well, it does like a little bit. I guess as long as the students aren't complaining, that's how well they want me to teach, right? What I really get paid for is to bring in grant money and research for the university. Fortunately or unfortunately, that's just that's kind of how it is, right? So to do that, we need to come up with new things. So computer scientists are all about coming up with new methods. And where do we look for new methods? Not only that, but as we develop new methods, as we collect new data, the complexity of problems that need to be solved increases, right? The traveling salesman problem was pretty easy when salesmen walked around 
how's the house selling like, I don't know, knives or vacuums or whatever. But today's traveling salesman involves like a billion customers on Amazon, right? So the complexity of problems just goes way, way up. And so we need robust problem solving technology for solving these new complex problems. So that's why we would look to like, if you think about it, nature is pretty much the most complex thing we look at, like organisms running around eating and like competing for resources. Like it's a complex thing. So how does, how does nature do it? So some problems were too complex for existing algorithms. And so they wanted to see if this natural selection evolution could help us solve the problems. Evolutionary computing can simulate evolutionary processes with millions of generations, right? Because if we can phrase the problem for a computer, well, the computer doesn't need to wait millions of years, doesn't even need to wait decades. Depending on the speed of your evaluation and your simulation, you can have like millions of generations happening per second in a, in a good computer, right? So if you can have evolution happening at that scale, it might be able to solve your problem for you. So if we can model the problem in terms of environment, individuals, and fitnesses, then perhaps evolutionary computation can provide solutions. So let's look at an example. Let's say we want to schedule exams at the university. That's a complex problem. The problem has professors, hundreds of professors, tens of thousands of students, hundreds if not thousands of rooms and courses, and dozens of time slots. Okay? So, the possible permutations of all possible students, rooms, courses, time slots, profs, and schedules is like so exponential, you don't even want to think about it. So you can't brute force this problem. You've got to come up with something. And so let's say we want to satisfy some sort of constraint. For example, um, no student or professor can have more than one exam at a time. So you either have to have zero exams or one exam at any time and no more. Um, no room can have more than one exam in it at a, at a time. And students can't have three exams in a day, right? So huge, gigantic search space. The majority of it isn't even valid. So in evolutionary computing terms, how would we turn this problem into something for an evolutionary algorithm? Well, we would say the problem is our environment, right? And in a candidate individual is a schedule. So if you come up with any schedule, let's say you made a random schedule. So you have this exam here and here. I have the, this exam here and here for everyone at the, at the university. One schedule is one individual. Then what you could do is you could take all of these constraints, run it over your schedule, and then produce a number, which is a fitness, that says, what's the validity of this schedule? Well, if one schedule satisfies all the constraints, that's a very fit schedule. If another one has like 200 students with conflicts, then that's a less fit schedule. So what we would do in our GA implementation of this is that better schedules would have better chances to recombine into new schedules that ideally had better properties. So again, um, we have populations of individuals exists in an environment with limited resources. Competition for those resources causes the selection of individuals that are better adapted these individuals reproduce to form new generations of individuals through recombination and mutation. The new individuals are going to have their fitnesses evaluated. Good fitnesses are chosen to reproduce and pass on their traits. Over time, ideally, this process causes overall fitness to rise. So here's uh, an example of this. This is just a cycle. This is the evolutionary cycle. We start with a population of individuals, all with their genes here, right? We're going to evaluate 
everything by a fitness value. So for example, um, that one we looked at uh, for exams, like how many conflicts there were, for example. So we're going to evaluate them. We have a fitness value. Some of these things are somehow, based on their fitness value, going to be chosen for reproduction. So if they have a higher fitness value, they're going to have a higher chance to be chosen for reproduction. Not guaranteed, higher chance. After, uh, so in order to reproduce, crossover happens. And after crossover, mutation happens. And then all of these parents that reproduced, all of those children form the new population. Okay? So how does that look in pseudocode? Well, let's have a look. First, we're going to initialize a population with just random individuals. Sometimes people seed the population with things that aren't random, for, but for the most part, let's just start with random individuals, random schedules for exams. And then we were going to repeat until some termination condition happens. Um, there's a bunch of different things you could have for a termination condition. Typically, because the problems we're, we're trying to solve are so difficult, typically you'll have a time limit, right? So run this for an hour or run it for a hundred generations or something like that. But another termination condition is if you know like the maximum possible fitness. So for the example, the scheduling one, if something has no conflicts, it's a perfect schedule. So keep going until you have a perfect schedule could be another termination condition, but that's our while loop that we're going to use. So you evaluate the population by evaluating each individual fitness. You're going to select parents that have a high fitness somehow from that population. You combine parents to form offspring. You mutate the resulting offspring. And then the next population is formed by those offspring. So each loop of this is called a generation. Just like in human terms, each, each loop of the genetic algorithm, or sorry, the evolutionary algorithm is called one generation. Okay. So ideally, you know, on generation one, everything is random. Fitness is gonna be really poor. But by generation 100 or a million or whatever, maybe we've got some functioning individuals. There are different types of evolutionary algorithms. And this gets a little confusing for some people. So evolutionary computing, evolutionary algorithms is the name for the branch of study for all of these algorithms. Okay. So there's no such thing as just like that's an evolutionary algorithm, right? That's a, it's a name for a, a discipline for a group of algorithms, like a search algorithm right? That's, there's BFS, there's DFS, there's this, there's that, there's A star, there's the other thing, right? So EA is, is the name for a, a group of algorithms. Different evolutionary algorithms are essentially only different in their representations of individuals. So every evolutionary algorithm follows this pseudocode, all right? The difference between individual algorithms is how things are represented. So if you use binary strings or integers for your representation, representation of individuals, you have genetic algorithms. So if you've ever heard of genetic algorithms, GAs are a type of EA that use integers or binary as their genotypic representation. Okay. If you used real valued vectors instead of integers, that's called evolutionary strategies. If you use finite state machines, that's called evolutionary programming. And if you use Lisp trees or, well, they don't have to be Lisp, but they call them Lisp trees. Um, that's genetic programming. And we'll go into genetic programming a little bit, a little bit later. The differences are largely cosmetic, right? So for example, if you wanted to evolve a Sudoku board, you can do that with integers. So um, you can use genetic algorithms for that. If you wanted to evolve some source code, 
then you couldn't do it with just integers. You would do that with Lisp trees. Okay. Um, yeah, someone said I had a typo here. So let me just fix that. Finite state machines. All right. So the, the largely cosmetic, but essentially what you do if, is you say, okay, if I want to use evolutionary algorithm, algorithms for this, let me analyze my problem. And based on the problem, I'm going to choose a representation. And then based on the representation, I'm going to choose which algorithm that I'm going to use. Um, and you're going to choose variation operators that suit that. So the main components of an evolutionary algorithm then are the representation. And this is a good exam question. Okay. So the definition of individuals, how you represent them, the evaluation or the fitness function. So how do you actually tell if something is a good qual a good candidate for reproduction, the population, how many things are in the population? What does a population actually look like? The parent selection mechanism. So how do you actually, once you have fitness is assigned to all the individuals, how do you actually select them to reproduce? Variation operators. So how do you recombine two parents to form a child? How do you mutate after that? There's something called survivor selection mechanism where you can actually replace children. So maybe you want to like insert some random genes or keep parents that were really fit. There's lots of evolutionary algorithms basically become all of these little tweaks and knob tuning to try and make your algorithm perform, perform better. So these are all the different um, components that you can have in an evolutionary algorithm. So uh, before I get too deep into, into each of these, okay, now I'm going to keep going for a minute. So representations. Candidate solutions are individuals, right? Like one um, Sudoku board or one exam schedule. And they exist in the phenotype state. So candidate solutions, like in, let's say we're playing, I'll, I'll, I think I have a diagram coming up. So candidate solutions exist in the phenotype space. So the phenotype is the actual candidate solution. That is the schedule. That is the Sudoku board, for example. They are encoded in chromosomes, which exist in the genotype space. So genotype is the representation of the phenotype that actually undergoes reproduction. Like we can't directly combine two schedules. We have to get the genotype of the schedule and then recombine the genotypes. So the encoding means taking the actual problem, the phenotype, the actual individual, excuse me, and converting it into its genetic representation. And then decoding takes the genetic representation and turns it back into the phenotype. So you have to have a one-to-one -one mapping from genotype to phenotype. Because what you do is you take your actual candidate solution, turn it into the genetic representation, do all your genetic algorithm magic with that. And then once you see a fit individual, you're going to turn it back into a phenotype. So in order to find a global optimum, every possible solution must be represented in the genotype space. And that just means make sure you take your representation such that every possible solution you can make in your genotype. So let's look at the example coming up in our assignment. Here, for, so for assignment four, we are going to be doing a genetic algorithm Sudoku solver, okay? Sudoku is cool because it has a very easy phenotype to genotype representation. And also there's a nice UI, it's easy to intuit, uh, intuitively visualize, et cetera, et cetera. So the phenotype is a candidate solution. All right. So here is a partially filled in Sudoku board. Hopefully you all know what Sudoku is. This is a candidate solution, meaning what we're going to do with this is pass it into some function that evaluates how good it is. So maybe a blank Sudoku board would get a zero and a fully completed, properly done Sudoku board would get the maximum infinity score or something like that. 
However, in order to do an evolutionary algorithm to solve this, we are going to turn the phenotype into a genotype. And a genotype has to have, well, for a genetic algorithm at least, this one-dimensional array type structure. So for a Sudoku board, it's really, really easy. We just go through, let's go through from left to right up on the top. This five is the first thing in the genotype. This three is the second thing in the genotype. This isn't filled out, so we call it a zero. This isn't filled out, so we call it a zero. Here's a seven. And we go on and on and on until we get down to the seven and the nine. So this is a very intuitive example where we take the phenotype, which is the, the candidate solution in the actual problem space, and we map it to a genotype, which is an individual in the population of the evolution space. Okay, so that's the important exam question, wink, wink type thing that is, that is very important to understand when it comes to evolutionary algorithms. But what is this fitness function? The fitness function represents the requirements that the population should adapt to. So it's going to assign real valued fitnesses to each phenotype with forms, which, uh, which forms the basis for selection. There are three typos in that sentence. Hang on. Read value fitnesses to each phenotype, which forms, geez. Oh. All right. The fitness function assigns, <laughs> assigns a real valued fitnesses to each phenotype which forms the basis for selection. The more fine-grained different values, the better. Meaning that if you can pick it apart and give it really fine-grained values, that that's better than like, you know, just saying good, better, best. Usually, we talk about fitnesses being maximized. So some problems may be minimization. So for example, if you want to minimize the conflicts in a schedule, well, all you would do is if you have le fewer conflicts, you give it a higher fitness, all right? So genetic algorithms maximize things. They maximize fitness. So if you do need to minimize a value, you just flip it like that. So here's an example fitness function. Let's say we wanted to do Sudoku, okay? so. One thing we could do, let's generate a random board over here. And what we can do is maybe say something like, the fitness is how many unique values appear in the rows and columns. So if we look here, we have an eight, a nine, a six, an eight, a two, a four, a six, a six, and a one. So there are six different numbers here. Ideally, for Sudoku, we would want nine different numbers there, right? So, this six is a lower fitness than a nine, which is the thing that we optimally desire to have. So, we could say, uh, sum up all of these values for the rows and the columns, and, and also the squares, right? And if we sum all of that up, we have the fitness for a Sudoku. Now, whether, you know, this makes some intuitive sense. It may not be the best possible function, but after we run this for a little while, maybe we get a bunch of rows which have eight things, a bunch of thing, rows which have nine things in them. And so we get closer and closer to a solved Sudoku board if we, if we do this way. Similarly, this is extremely low resolution, but let's say we wanted to evolve something like uh, a creature for walking, right? So if our candidate individual is like the bone structure or whatever for this, and our fitness function would be a simulation that sends it walking, and the fitness would be how far it actually walked. So what I want to do is show you this example, which is online, and I'll paste this into the chat so you can follow along but yours will look different. So here we have this really cool simulation. Um, it is an example of a genetic algorithm. So the phenotypes here are these vehicles. The vehicles are constructed with this geometry where they have wheels 
and some randomized structure that holds the wheels together. This is actually an incredible example. So um, this one got evolved really fast. But essentially, they they are going, um, they are going forward. Well, their goal is to go as far as possible, right? So an initial randomized population gets created with these structures. And then based on how far it made it to the right, that is its fitness. Then it uses some algorithm to choose the structures which have higher fitnesses and those have a higher chance at reproduction. So they also apply some mutation to make them better over time. But you can see that only in a few generations, now we have many things in the population that resemble this really well-performing thing. This, uh, this little hump is hard to get over because you can see that they've got to evolve like a chassis on the bottom that doesn't get stuck on that thing. So this is just, it's a really cool example. Um, oh, almost got over. Let's restart it and see if we can get something that looks a little different. So at first, oh wow, got a good one right off the bat that time. And let's look for another couple of generations. Okay, that one flipped onto its back. This one is still going. Sort of slow and steady. Okay, oh. All right. So now the ones that did well pass on their genes. And you can see this one looks like one of the ones that did well. But it's a little bit different. Right? Slowly you're starting to see more and more of the population um, be more fit for the environment. And so you can see evolving over time eventually does um, eventually does produce better results. So play around with that. that that's a cool example that I, that I like to show. But you can see here that the difficulty of GAs lies in the translation between the phenotype, which is like this car. So let's look at this car, right? Let's bring up... Um, our MS Paint here. So let's look at this car. How would you translate this? Let me close this down a little bit. I'll bring back up the slides. How would you translate this into a genotype? Because this is the phenotype, right? So if we type it out here, this is the phenotype. Can we brainstorm this? This is where it gets difficult. We don't need this. What we have to do is somehow turn this into an array of values. If we're using a genetic algorithm, at least, right? Let's put an array. Sorry for the clicking. All right. So someone out there said, um, what size wheels, various shape and characteristics, XY displacement of the lines existing the center of the shape. So people out there are getting good ideas. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this website happens to do it, but let's say, for example, we have, um, so it looks like to me, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are always eight lines going out from the center. So it looks like what they have is they have a shape like this, and there are eight lines coming out from it like this. However, it's not a uh, it's not a circle. It's like if it's a polygon, so they would form like this, right? That's what they're doing. So it looks like part of the GA is choosing these angles, right? So this angle here is quite small, but this angle here is quite large. Right? This one is smaller. And also it looks like they're varying the length of these things. So maybe the angles could be like, okay, this is the angle right here. Um, this is angle two. This is angle three. This is angle four. Right? This is angle five. Now maybe this right here, this length, this is length one. This is length two. This is length three. This is length four. This is length five. Also, we may have like which um, number of, of this thing the wheels are on, 
So let's start drawing in a different color. So like, which numbered line is this wheel on? Maybe that's, maybe that's this one. Which numbered line is this wheel on? Maybe that's this one. Looks like we also have radiuses and masses of the wheels. So all of these go into the, uh, into the genotype, right? And that's what we have to do. When we want to solve a particular problem with a genetic algorithm or an evolutionary algorithm in the, in the general case, we have to come up with a way of representing our thing in a genotypic space. All right. Because the algorithm only works on the genomes, not on the phenotype, which is this hugely complex thing. So that's what we have to do. So if you can come up with a way of taking your candidate solution and moving it into um, a genotype, you can use a GA. All righty. Let's continue on with the lecture. Good example. So a population holds a representation of possible solutions. Oh, I got the wrong scene. There we go. Populations typically have a fixed size. So when you go to run a genetic algorithm, you'll be able to say, I ran 500 generations of a population of size 2000. Okay. Um, some sophisticated evolutionary algorithms assert a special structure on the population, like a grid or whatever, but we're going to stay away from that. Selection operators usually take the whole population into account. Um, so that means, for example, if we're looking to choose parents, we're going to evaluate everything in the population, and then we're going to use some algorithm for selecting which thing to pick. And we'll get into those selection algorithms and stuff and crossover mutation. We'll get into that stuff. The diversity of the population refers to the number of different fitnesses and phenotypes and genotypes. So diversity meaning we don't want like just two parents to make all of the things in our population. We would want like a genetic diversity. Um, so what we're going to see in assignment four, and I'm not going to dissect this graph just yet because it is part of assignment four. If we have a diverse population, then we're going to have like some maybe randomized individuals with poor fitnesses. Sorry, this graph is fitness over time of the population. So on the left, we may have a fitness value. And on the right, we have generations as it evolves. So the blue line here is going to be the fitness of the most fit individual, the maximum fitness of the population. Ideally, what we see as we run a genetic algorithm is that the maximum fitness goes up over time, okay? The black line here is the average fitness over time. And you do want there to be an average fitness that is below the maximum fitness because you need to have a variety of individuals in order for their, you know, you've ever heard of like the gene pool. You want the gene pool to be deep, not shallow, right? You want there to be a bunch of stuff to choose from. So we may insert some random genes, for example, um, down here for things to recombine with. So the minimum possible value may be low. The average is somewhere in between and the maximum is up top. However, you could have something like this where we have a, a very non-diverse population, right? So at some point, this population became too homogeneous, right? A few individuals may have taken over the population so that now um, there's no randomness being inserted, right? The, the minimum being so close to the average, being so close to the maximum is not healthy for your algorithm. You want there to be more diverse population. So you can look at these results over time and tell lots of stuff about the genetic algorithm. You can talk about elitism ratios and your mutation rate, and you can see things about like, um, are you inserting random genes or not? And we'll talk about this um, during the next lecture. So parent selection mechanism. How do you actually choose parents to, to recombine to form a new solution? Well, your parent selection mechanism is going to be an algorithm that assigns probabilities of individuals as parents depending on their fitnesses. It's usually probabilistic, right? So higher quality solutions, so more fit individuals, 
should be more likely to reproduce, but it shouldn't be guaranteed, right? And you should also make it so that your worst possible candidate has a non-zero chance of reproducing. Meaning that you always want there to be the chance that the lowest, um, the lowest fit solution um, gets the chance to reproduce, right? You always want there to be that bar on the corner where two people could always reproduce. Uh, that, that does good things for the gene pool. And stochasticity, so randomness, can help you escape local optima, and we'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later. So the one of the ways, there are many, 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 many different ways that you can choose parents based on their fitness. One of those is called roulette wheel selection. Okay? And it's, in my opinion, the most intuitive to understand. So let's say that we have um, five individuals in the population. One, two, three, four, five. We've assigned them some fitnesses, and those fitnesses are going to be assigned probabilities of being chosen. So let's just say we take a linear probability, right? Let's say that this individual was given a fitness of 31. This one has a fitness of 5, this one is 38, this one is 12, this one is 14. And we have this, like, you know, this roulette wheel over here, or I guess it's more like, uh, you know, spinning a, spinning a wheel on the price is right or something. We go like, ding, 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 ding. And as you spin it, the probability of three or one being chosen is very high, and the probability of two, three, or four is much lower, right? So they had, what you do is you spin the wheel, and whatever it lands on, that's, that's the thing that you choose. Or some people also call this dartboard selection because you can think of this as like the dartboard and then you close your eyes and you throw a dart and whatever it lands on is chosen, right? So this is a, it's a way that you, you assign a higher probability to something with a higher fitness being chosen, but there is always that probability of lower things being chosen, right? So that is the intuitive notion of what's called roulette wheel selection. Roulette wheel selection, here is the algorithm for roulette wheel selection. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over the algorithm, then I'm going to illustrate the algorithm so you actually understand it, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to take in a population, and that population is going to be evaluated. Each individual is going to have their fitness evaluated and stored in a new array. So let's say the population is an array of individuals, and then you have a second array, which is the population fitnesses. And that's just for each individual, you have the fitness of, of each individual, right? So it's an array of integers or real values or whatever. Then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate a, a value called max. And that's just going to be the sum of all of the fitnesses, okay? So the maximum possible value that you're going to choose in the next step is going to be the sum of all the fitnesses. Then you're going to make a pick between zero and that max value. Then what you're going to do is, let me illustrate it. Illustrating this is, is easier, I think. Let's do it right on this slide. So let's say we have, uh, this is the pop fitnesses array right here, okay? So uh, let me draw some lines. Do, 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 do. This is our pop fitnesses array. Let's say we're going to have like four, uh, 10, uh, seven, nine, 12, four, 30, and uh, 18. So these are the fitnesses that we've calculated for everything in our population, our population of size eight. So what does the algorithm say? It says, okay, we've done this part. We've assigned fitnesses to our population. Now we need to calculate max, which is the sum of all of those things. So someone help me out here. Say it in the chat. What do I got? 4 and 10 is 14, 21, 30, 42, 46, 76, 94. 94, perfect. Someone out there got it. So max is equal to 90. Ah, I can't draw with a mouse. Oh my God. 94. So 
Now I'm going to have a value called current, which is equal to zero. Then what I do is for i equal to zero to population.length, so I'm gonna loop over this eight times here because I have eight things in my population. Current, what we're gonna do is take that population, index i, and add it to current. And then I'm gonna say, if current is greater than pick, return population i. Oops, I forgot pick. Someone give me a random number between zero and 94. Okay, let's say it's 51. I've chosen a random number between zero and 51. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna loop over all of these things over here. Sorry, I've already got a random number for everyone to try to choose one. So current, I'm going to add four to it, okay? So current is now four. Current is four. I ask, is current greater than pick? No. Well, if it is, I return population I as the, as the thing I want to choose. So it's not. So I go to the next one, which is 10. So now uh, C is 14, right? Because it was four. I say, is 14 greater than 51? No, it isn't. So go to the next one. Is 21 greater than 51? No, it isn't. Go to the next one. Is 30 greater than 51? No, it isn't. Go to the next one. Is 42 greater than 51? No, go to the next one. Is 45 greater, 42, sorry, 46 greater than 51? Nope, go to the next one. Is 76 greater than 51? Yes. So this is the one that we have chosen. And what this is, is based on your fitnesses, okay, it weights them linearly so they each have a chance to be chosen which is proportional to their fitness. All right, so that's the roulette wheel selection algorithm and that's how you would implement this spinning wheel. Um, okay, someone said, why do we set max equal to sum? Because this is, okay, max is probably a bad variable name, but max is just used as the maximum number for your random number selection. So you're going to choose a number between zero and max. So this should just be called sum. I don't know why I called it max. Um, let's change it right now, okay? So sum, sum, there we go. Good, good suggestion. It's a terrible variable name and variable names mean something. Okay, so there it is. Now it's called sum. All right, that's the algorithm. You are going to implement that in assignment four. Variation operators, we're almost done. We're getting there. Um, the role of variation operators is to generate new candidate solutions. So from parents to offspring. Usually divided into two types in according to their number of inputs. So mutation operators have a single input recombinations, recombination operators have more than one input, but if we just have two inputs, we're going to call this crossover. And so most EAs are going to use both recombination and mutation. So here is crossover and mutation. So let's say we have two parents, parent one and parent two and we want to combine them somehow into two new offspring, okay? What we do is we're, and this is the most basic possible form of crossover, and it's what we're gonna do on assignment four, is we're gonna take the first half of parent one and combine it with the second half of parent two. And that's what we get up here. And then for the second child, we take the first half of parent two and combine it with the second half of parent one. That's it. That's crossover. It's called crossover because we take, we cross over parts of one and the other. I don't know else how, how to say it. The mutation part comes after crossover where maybe you're bitten by a radioactive spider or a random gamma ray passes through and makes you the Hulk, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of these, if let's say we have a binary string, mutation will just maybe flip one of the bits at random. What is that gonna do? I don't know. Maybe it's really good, maybe it's really bad. Maybe it doesn't really do anything, okay? So it's just the flipping of data randomly. Maybe our mutation 
instead of flipping a bit, it swaps two elements. It's also interesting. That that could that could be, right? A mutation just takes something and changes it randomly somehow. Okay? There's no set way to do it. For our Sudoku, we're gonna take a random number and turn it into another random number. That's it. Next, we have something called survivor selection. Could also be called environmental selection. Most evolutionary algorithms use a fixed population size and they essentially need a way of going from parents and offspring to a next generation. Oftentimes it's deterministic. So it's fitness based. So you can just rank all of them and select. It could have age based. So you could take, you know, something that's older and, and bring it on to the next population. It's not true that all parents always have to die each generation. Maybe you have a little counter that says make things live for three generations or something like that. You could also have something called elitism. And elitism ends up being a very powerful technique where let's say, for example, you say that the best solution, the best individual from every um, generation always gets moved to the next generation. So maybe the top 5% always get moved along. All right. So the initialization and termina term termination is the last part. Initialization is usually done randomly um, in order to, so that you get an even mixture of candidates. Um, it could use some heuristics, could use some existing solutions, but you know, just generating a bunch of random genotypes is usually pretty good. The termination condition is going to be, we reach some known or desired fitness, we reach a generation limit, we reach some amount of diversity, or we reach like a generation limit with no improvements. So how we stop the GA is up to you, right? That's up to you and it's based on the problem. The typical behavior of a genetic algorithm is going to look something like this. Let's say that on the X axis here, we have candidate solutions. Okay, and let's just say for sake of argument that our candidate solutions can be drawn on one line, right? We can't draw Sudoku boards on, on a line from left to right, but let's just say that they can for, for, ease of in, like, for ease of visualizing this. When we start and we initialize, we're gonna have a bunch of candidates all over the place and their fitnesses are gonna kind of be wild right? Some of the fitnesses like this one up here might be kind of high. Some of the fitnesses down here are going to be kind of low. So the important part being that an evolutionary algorithm is people call it sometimes a hill climbing algorithm. Because what's going to happen is that when you see individuals or candidate solutions on these hills, like for example, this one here is sort of on this hill. It's going to climb sort of toward the top of those hills, okay? So if we look, these candidates have risen to the top of this hill. These have risen to the top of this hill. However, based on your problem, maybe over here somewhere, there was a way bigger hill, right? And your algorithm, because the fitnesses were locally good, they were climbing up this sort of fitness hill, but because of that, they couldn't get to the global optimum, right? So let me discard all of these annotations. Let me look at this again. So these individuals, they're going to change a little bit. Random mutations and recombination and selection, it's not often that we get such drastically different changes that they move like greatly on this line. So this guy here is going to move, slowly move up. This one here is going to slowly move up until it looks like this, where they're sort of more clustered and then they get up to like the top of the hill, right? But like I said, it might be that there's another hill over here that nobody got to. And so the only thing that would have gotten us from here to start to go over here would have been some wild change in the genome, like a crazy change. And we, had, we maybe had to get unreasonably lucky 
in order to get here. But the point being that in order for like this, this one, right? If this was the hill, in order for this one to get to that hill through gradual change, it would have had to go down first. And we don't want things to go down, right? So it's very difficult for that to happen. All right. So this is called local maxima. And it's a problem in basically every algorithm ever. We get stuck in these local maxima because we're sort of wiggling things a little bit with, um, with uh, mutation and crossover and selection, but we're wiggling it in these local areas. So we get to these local maxima and then we're stuck. Sucks. Here's an example with Sudoku that will be the bane of your existence for assignment four. Look at this. We have a Sudoku board which satisfies, it has a very high fitness, a very, very high fitness, almost everything. Look, all of these have all nines. All of these have all nines. All of these have all nines. However, in these two columns, there are two ones and there are two threes. So this is like, this Sudoku board is this one right here. Totally locally optimal. However, as if you have played Sudoku, you know that this local optima is just death. Because in order to solve the board, you might have to change this number and this number and this number and this number and this number. Maybe even the whole board. It's, it might not be possible to solve it from this position without changing a dozen numbers, right? So what you've got to do in order to take this and turn it into a solved board is possibly start decreasing your fitness. But if you start decreasing your fitness in order to get to this huge, like solved value that's over here, well, if you're decreasing your fitness, then you're no longer being chosen for selection. So maybe if you in, like introduce some random variables, you get like a lucky jump from here to here, but that doesn't happen very often. Okay, so just keep in mind that local optima are the bane of any algorithm. And it turns out that genetic algorithms actually do a better job at escaping local optima than, than most algorithms. So it's very unlikely that you'd have something stuck here because it would have wiggled this way or this way with genetic mutation. All right, so a typical GA run is going to look something like this. If this is the best possible fitness in... In your, if this is the best possible fitness you can have, and this is time, oh, sorry, this is the best fitness of any individual in the population, and this is the number of generations, what you're typically going to see is that the first half <laughs> of your run is going to be huge gains, and then the second half of your run is going to be gradual, gradual improvements, okay? And you'll see this as soon as you get your GA working, and... Your goal with a GA is to sort of, you know, this is going to plateau out eventually. And if you get lucky and a random mutation causes it to spike, then maybe you start getting more gains up here. Okay, so GAs are designed um, to try and not get trapped in these local optima, but they can, they can be bad. So again, this is the process. Um, repeat until we have some termination condition after we've initialized a population with random individuals. We evaluate the population, give them fitnesses, select parents with high fitness, maybe with roulette wheel selection, combine the parents to form offspring using our crossover, mutate the resulting offspring, and then form a next population. And this here, this sort of pseudocode, that's what you'll be given for assignment four. And what you have to do is implement, evaluate, implement, select, implement, combine, implement, mutate. So these are the four functions that you're going to be writing for assignment four. And I think you'll have fun doing that. Okay, that's it for today. Um, if we look on Tuesday, uh, next class, I'll be going over a little bit more of genetic pro. So genetic programming is really cool. Just maybe like 20 minutes on genetic programming. 
and then we'll go over assignment four. Okie doke. So be careful. <laughs> that was half of 3201 fit in one lecture. Yeah, I know. Yeah, evolutionary algorithms aren't that special. Like you can teach them pretty quick. Um, so keep note on assignment due dates. Assignment four is going to be, re be released before assignment three is due. So in order to give you more time on assignment three, okay, I'm just releasing assignment four earlier. So assignment four is due on the, uh, sorry, assignment three is due on the 28th. So that's when this is due. All right. And just to give you more time on assignment four, if you want it, three weeks, it's a lot of time. If you want extra time, it's honestly, assignment four is probably the easiest one. I, I think that assignment four is the easiest. It just unfortunately worked out that I have to teach so much stuff in order for you to be able to do assignment five, that there's less time for assignment five. Uh, uh, that, that, that there's so much time for assignment four, excuse me, because assignment five um, takes so much knowledge. All right. Someone said, can finding local maxima be minimized by starting with more randomness or using more rotation? Yes. Um, more, more mutation? Yes. And in fact, what we will see, tune in the next time, that we can actually have controls to vary these things in real time and see how that affects things. So let's save that stuff as sort of a, uh, a teaser uh, for the next class. And I, I won't, I won't ask, answer any more questions right now. But thank you for tuning in. And uh, I'm looking forward to introducing uh, Simon 4 in the next class.